Greetings, I bring you John chapter 13. All its verses will begin in verse 1. Now, before the festival of the Passover, knowing that his time had come to depart from this world to the Father, or as I like to say, the simulation. So, Jesus is departing from this simulation back to the Father in New Jerusalem. Jesus, having loved his own, who were in the world, loved them to the end. To the end. Doesn't that sound familiar? I think it's in the Olivet Prophecy. And in other scriptures too, Revelation, where it says that the saints of God have to also endure to the end. To the very end. Verse 2. And during the supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, that he should betray Jesus, Jesus having, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God. Okay. What does that mean to you spiritually? There's a golden nugget in there, that latter part. So, Jesus had come from a whole nother realm. He didn't come from this universe. Jesus is not from here, not even God. They're in a whole different universe. Another realm, like I like to say as well. Not in this simulation. Okay? And he was going to God. So he's going back. Verse 4, Jesus rose from supper and laid aside his garments, and after taking a towel, he secured it around himself. Next he poured water into a washing basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wash them with a towel which he had secured. Now is there a connection between Jesus being anointed three times? So twice was his feet and once was his head with very expensive perfume, ointments, spike nard, etc. And here he's going to wash his disciples' feet. So it's interesting. That's all I have for that verse. Something to think about. Maybe uh, tell me in the comments. Verse 6. Then he came to Simon Peter, and he said, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing, you do not understand now, <clears throat> but you shall know after these things. So that's a good lesson for us too, where if we don't understand what God is telling us to do, like we read an instruction, just do it first. Same with like authority figures, like your parents. As long as it's not a sin, when they tell you, God tells you to do something, you do it. Because maybe God doesn't have to always explain, you know, give you understanding on something right away. You just do it first, and then God will give you the understanding. Maybe there's some lessons in your life that work that way. Same with your parents. Jesus decided to do it this way. He could have told the disciples right away, but he tells them in the next couple of verses why he does it. So look for that in your trials or in what when you're trying to practice something. So verse 8, Peter, of course, this is like comical relief. Peter said to Jesus, You shall not wash my feet, not ever. And Jesus answered him, <clears throat> If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, wait a second. Not my feet only, but also my hands in my head. And Jesus said to him, The one who has been washed does not need to wash anything other than the feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all. Okay, this is interesting because they're clean 
And he's talking about, okay, and then the next verse says he's talking about Judas. Okay, let's let's read something because I really want to understand this more. I want us to really figure this one out. So here in the next two chapters, so chapter 15, Jesus talks about in verse 2, The Father takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit, but he cleanses each one that bears fruit, in order that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean through the word and I that I have spoken to you. So they're clean. That's interesting. They're clean, but they're not baptized. Okay. But wait a second. Judas isn't clean. I wonder why he's not clean. Let's keep reading here. Verse 11 and, and chapter 13. For Jesus knew the one who was betraying him. This was the reason he said, not all of you are clean. So what he's trying to say here is Judas wasn't clean was because he, he didn't allow the Spirit of God to lead him. So that's what it means to be clean. God is leading you. God is leading you. Before you're baptized, God leads you. His Spirit does. And Judas was rejecting Christ. He was rejecting the words of God. He wasn't obeying the, the Holy Spirit that was leading him. So he wasn't clean. Verse 12. Therefore, when he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and had sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? Okay, now here's the answer. You call me the teacher and the Lord, and you speak rightly because I am. I am. That's God. He's God. Wow. You're in the presence of God. That should be capitalized. Yeah. They didn't capitalize the the am. Hmm. Maybe the translator should have capitalized it. Verse 14. Therefore, if I, the Lord, and the teacher have washed your feet, you also are duty-bound to wash one another's feet. Now, what does that prove? That proves that we mimic Christ. We do. He's our trailblazer. So we do exactly as he does, as he did on this earth. And as we read in this scripture here, we do exactly as he says. And just like Paul says, it reminds me, it says, follow me as I follow Christ. Okay, verse 15. For I have given you an example to show that you also should do exactly as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I tell you, a servant is not greater than his Lord, nor a messenger greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Hmm. Let's go to James 1, verse 21 and 22. I like that, verse 17. Okay, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So, James 1. Verse 21 and 22. Oh, and this also helps with, with Judas, why he's not clean. Here, here's another good reason. Verse 21. Therefore, having rid yourselves of all filthiness and all the abounding of wickedness around you, then in meekness, accept, accept for yourselves the implanted word. Judas did in a accept Jesus he didn't a, a, accept how do you say that word it's so weird accept <laughs> the implanted word Judas didn't which is able to save your lives then be doers of the word and not only hears deceiving your own selves huh so you gotta be doers now that you know you gotta do. Okay. Now we're back to verse 18 in John 13. I am not speaking of you all, for I know whom I have chosen, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted his heel against me. Wow. He's warning them again. I am telling you at this time, before it happens, 
so that when it does happen, you may believe that I am. There you go, a second time, I am. Think about it. These disciples are in the presence of I am. A God is among them. Well, imagine being there. God's presence. Did they really realize that? <laughs> Probably not. Not at that time. Verse 20. Truly, truly, I tell you, the one who receives whomever I send is receiving me. And the one who receives me is receiving him who sent me. So that's like a chain of command. God is for a, a system that is like a chain of command that we have in the world. That's interesting. Verse 21, as he was saying these things, Jesus was troubled in the spirit, well, and testified saying, truly, truly, I tell you, one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, wondering of whom he was speaking. Now one of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, that's John, was leaning on Jesus' chest. And so Simon Peter motioned to him to ask who was the one of whom Jesus was speaking. Then he leaned back on Jesus' chest and asked him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, It is the one whom I shall give sop after I have dipped it. And then he had dipped the sop and he gave it to Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. Wow, and after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus said to him, Do what you do. What you do, do quickly. Wow. Then he left. So here's something interesting. Maybe you haven't thought of this, but I didn't know this. I actually didn't know. I just assumed, and it's good to, to know before you, 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 know, you just keep holding on to an assumption. So, here you have Satan entering into Judas. Was this the first time he entered into him? Because it, it does say he, he already put in Judas' heart what, that he's going to betray Jesus, but he didn't, did he enter him? Okay, so that was verse 27. Satan entered into Judas. Let's go to Luke 22, verse 3. This is a little bit before the Passover. So 22, verse 2. Okay. Let's not read verse 2. Let's see verse 1. Now the festival of unleavened bread, which is called Passover, was approaching. So this is before chapter John 13. Okay. Verse 3. Then Satan entered into Judas, whom was surnamed Iscariot, being numbered one of the twelve. There you go. So he entered Judas there. So Satan, so this is my assumption. Satan has the ability to enter and leave anyone he wants because he is, he is a busy demon. He's a busy red dragon. He's got all kinds of business going on to try to deceive everybody, the elect, the whole world. That's everybody. And here you go. He's Entering Judas Iscariot a second time. That's interesting. So now that establishes that Satan will enter the man of sin and he can leave the man of sin in and out, in and out. Does whatever he wants. As long as God allows it, of course. Okay, now we're back to John 13. Let's see. Verse 28. So after he tells Judas, okay, whatever you do, do quickly. But not one of those sitting at the table knew what he was talking, what he said to him. They, under, they didn't understand what he was saying. <sighs> Excuse me. For some thought, since Judas had the bag, that Jesus was telling him, buy the things that we need for the festival, or that he should give something to the poor. Okay. Yeah, he didn't. That's not what he said. So then, 
after receiving the sop, he immediately went out, and it was night. Okay. So there you go. The Passover takes place at night, and they already washed the feet. Now they're going to do the next part of the, the Passover. Hasn't started yet. Verse 31. Now when Judas was gone, Jesus said, Now has the Son of Man been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. And if God has been glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, in himself and shall immediately glorify him. So it, I picture a cycle of glorification. Like Jesus glorifies the Father, and then the, glor then the glorification goes back to Jesus, and then Jesus glorifies the Father again, and then the Father glorifies Jesus back. It's a reciprocal glorification relationship. Into the kingdom forever. Think about that. Now, we want to glorify God too with our sacrifice. We're living sacrifices. So think about how you can glorify God in His kingdom. Like all the projects that God gives you to do to expand His, His universe, His kingdom, and completing them, making Him happy. Mission complete, right? So that's, that's beautiful. So here it shows it's a reciprocal type of glorification that goes on forever, let's say. I think so. Maybe you can comment about that too. I'd like to know more about that. Okay, where was I? 33 little children. I am with you yet a little while. You shall seek me. <laughs> but as I told the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. I am now telling you also. So that's fascinating. He's letting them know I'm leaving the simulation because I'm spiritual. That's where I belong. And my time has come. It's his harvest. It's the harvest of the first of the first fruits. It's his timing. So Jesus couldn't have been harvested a year before this time, this moment. He had to be he has to be harvested at a specific time. We're going to see a little bit more about us, too. So a new commandment, verse 34. I give to you. New commandment. Whoa. Okay. That you love one another in the same way that I have loved you. That is how you are to love one another. Isn't that a high standard? That Jesus tells us. We have to love one another. That's a very high standard. That's a godly standard. And that separates us from the rest of the world. And we need to practice that. Whatever group you're in, there's so many groups within the body of Christ all over the world. Churches of God. Whatever organization they're in. The brethren there have to, are tested in having to love one another. There's different personalities. And it's possible God might send someone from another area, put him in a certain group because he wants you to be tested with this person's personality, the way they, they are. Let's say it's not a sin that the way they are. You know, because there are personality, personalities that clash. Things like that. So you practice loving one another. It's very tough. And it's a Philadelphian trait. If you want to make it to the place of safety, they're called brotherly love. Okay, the brethren loved each other. And I want to be a Philadelphian, so I have to practice that with my group. Really, you got to practice brotherly love. Like I said, it's a very high standard. If it's Philadelphian, it's very high. Highest standard. Highest. Verse 36, And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterwards. Wow. So that's what he's telling him. My harvest is now. You can't follow me into my harvest. I'm going to get harvested. This is my spiritual resurrection coming up. The wave sheaf. Yours is coming afterwards. What day is that? What holy day is that? Yes, it's Pentecost. That's the harvest of the first fruits. 144,000. 
No more, no less. And that's what he's talking about afterwards. We have our timing. We have to wait for it. We have to be patient. There is no save now for us. There is no save now. I'm trying to think of the Hebrew word. I can't think of it. The Jews were, were, were singing it. Save now, save now. Somewhere back here. Yeah, you know it. You're probably telling me right now. And I can't hear you. I'll, I'll read it after. So yeah, we, we there's a timing. There's a harvest for us. Right now, all the saints are sleeping before us. The ones that make it, they're in the faith chapter too. They're waiting. They haven't received their spiritual body yet. So that's what he says by afterwards, the harvest of Pentecost. Excuse me. Verse 37. Peter said to him, Why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered him. <laughs> he knows Peter was, wasn't messing around. This Peter wanted, he wanted that save now. He had that, he, you know, that's physical. Okay. Jesus answered him, You will lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I tell you, the cock shall not crow until you have denied me three times. So Peter's thinking physically. He wants God to fix all his problems now. Just like us, we have to think at the spiritual level, the same wavelength that Jesus thinks. It's all about the kingdom. It's all about the fruits of the Spirit. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. What is His righteousness? It's the nine fruits of the Spirit. We need all those in us. If we want to have that citizenship in the kingdom. Okay, what if we can't have all good relationships with people in the world and, you know, and, and our kids don't always obey us and, you know, our jobs don't always make us happy and our employers and and things don't just don't always go right for us not always that's what peter wanted peter wanted god to fix all of his physical challenges problems i meant to say problems and jesus said no no i didn't come here to 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 fix this to give you a utopia now i came here to show you the way so you mimic me now. So yeah, we, we got to watch out for that. We don't want that safe now attitude. Still can't think of that Hebrew word. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Okay, yeah. So anyways, in closing. So this is the Passover, obviously. Okay, I don't know when you're watching this. I'm reading this in December. So that's that's like, five months from now right or less i don't know i didn't count i can't think so i can't think right now so we have to prepare for the passover are you ready it's a very sobering moment the passover and make sure you're always examining yourself and you want that mindset that jesus has not peter's you gotta check yourself you know we, we have a lot of time right now we don't know how many Passovers we have left. Okay. And it's not something that you, you know, where you, you just renew your covenant and you're automatically forgiven of everything. No, you, you have to do your part. You have to continue practicing. Yeah. Thank you. That was John 13 in uh, Treasures in Scripture.